Hello there, economists. Welcome again to another of Mr. Beckstrom's AP Microeconomics content and review video sessions. Um, today's we'll cover the unit five topics of monopsony and revisiting minimum wage through a monopsony lens. So let's get down to it, shall we? All right, so pre previously we covered perfect competition in labor markets, wherein uh, neither individuals nor firms have any power to set the wage. Um, now we're going to talk about monopsony. Monopsony means a single buyer. You might remember monopoly from the product market where a single firm was the uh, sole provider of a good or service. Uh, in this case, it's a single firm, which is the uh, sole consumer of a productive resource. So a single buyer rather than a single seller. Um, so this would be imperfect competition in the factor market. We'll, we won't end up talking about any kind of blend between perfect competition and monopsony in the resource markets, though um, such models do exist. Um, so we have one firm hiring workers. That firm is large enough to manipulate the labor market. Uh, workers need to be relatively immobile. Um, and in this case, instead of being a wage taker, the firm is a wage maker. Um, now, one important assumption here that I want you to work with throughout this lesson is that the firm is unable to discriminate based on wage. So just like for a monopolist wanting to sell an additional unit of product, having to change the price for all buyers, a monopsonist wanting to hire an additional unit of labor must change the price or increase the wage for all of its workers. In practice, it's not usually like that. Um, there is discrimination in labor markets as we've previously discussed, but for now, put that aside. Some examples might be the NCAA. So if you're a college aged athlete, the NCAA would be uh, one of the only options for you to do highly competitive athletics, and as we know, they pay uh, nothing. Um, another example might be the classic economic example of a coal mining town, wherein there's a coal mine that employs a huge percentage of the people uh, that work in a town, and maybe everyone other than your shop owners and things like that. Um, Okay, so let's do go through a numerical derivation of why Acme Coal Mining Company would have to increase the wage that it pays to its workers in order to hire another worker. Um, and the point here is that marginal resource cost or marginal factor cost is going to be not equal to the supply of labor as it is in a perfectly competitive scenario. Um, so um, since Acme Coal Mining is the only game in town, they face the entire market supply of labor in that town, which is an upward sloping curve. Um, and you can see the uh, supply schedule given here. So at a wage rate of $4 an hour, no one's going to apply for that coal mining job. At a wage rate of $10 an hour, um, eight units of labor workers are going to apply for that coal mining job. So to find the marginal resource cost, what we do is take the difference in dollar value between hiring one worker and hiring two workers and hiring three workers and so on and so on and so on. So We've had, we can hire one worker at $4.50 per hour. If we want to hire two workers, we're going to need to increase the wage to $5 per hour. Um, that is a change of $5.50, $5 for the new worker plus 50 cents for the worker who already would have been willing to work for $4.50. Um, and if you want to hire a third worker, the wage has to go up by yet 50 more cents. So the marginal resource cost of hiring the third worker is $6.50 per hour, which includes the $5.50 for the third worker, $0.50 cents for the second worker, and $0.50 more cents on top of the additional $0.50 cents from that first worker. And it goes on and on and on. So as you can see, the um, quantity of labor plotted with the marginal resource cost against the quantity of labor plotted with the wage rate. So this is the supply of labor, these two columns here plotted together, and these two columns here plotted together would be the marginal resource cost curve. When we graph it, yes, when we graph it, it looks like this. So we have our supply of labor, which is an upward sloping curve. The firm faces the entire market supply 
And so we have vis-a-vis vis vis the law of supply, an upward sloping supply curve. We have our downward sloping demand for labor curve because this firm, just like all firms, is subject to the law of diminishing marginal returns. So the marginal unit of labor is less and less valuable to them as it becomes less and less productive in the short run. And when we throw our marginal resource cost curve, onto the graph, it looks something like that. Um, so for pretty much the exact same rationale that the marginal revenue curve falls below the demand curve for a monopolist or a firm with market power, the marginal resource cost curve uh, lies above the supply of labor curve for a firm with power in the labor market. So if you take a look at this graph, you can kind of puzzle out where is this firm going to end up hiring and what wage are they going to pay? If you analyze this just like a monopoly graph, though, you'll make a pretty common mistake. So you may have already seen that the quantity that this firm will hire is Q sub E. Uh, you can obviously already tell that this is fewer units of labor than a free market or a perfectly competitive situation would yield in this same scenario, um, which would be right there. Now the wage, what's the wage that the firm must pay in order to get Q sub E labor to come out and apply for these jobs? It's W sub E down here. So we take that quantity, if you remember, it's a one, two, three process. Step one, MRC equals MRP gives us not the wage, but the quantity. Plug that quantity into the supply of labor curve, step two, in order to find the wage that that firm must offer in order to hire Q sub E workers. So if you look for the original equilibrium point, if this were a free and competitive market, the wage would be higher and the quantity of labor hired would be higher right there at our equilibrium point. So the firm having market power in this labor market is driving wages down and creating unemployment. Uh, the yellow region there is the area of consumer surplus. Remember, consumer surplus is accrued by the firm or is beneficial to a firm. Producer surplus is the orange area. The orange area would be beneficial to individuals or households. And then the gray area is dead weight loss, the triangle little uh, next to the equilibrium point, which you are probably familiar with. Remember, dead weight loss created by fewer transactions being made, or in this case, fewer workers being hired. So unemployment. So let's talk minimum wage. If you recall from the last video, we went through this example on minimum wage. Would you support an $18 an hour minimum wage? Sounds good if you can get that job, but hey, look, it creates a ton of unemployment. There's way more workers looking for work at $18 an hour than there are jobs available because at the higher wage, employers are going to hire less and more individuals are going to join that job market or that labor pool trying to get that job and there's our surplus of workers and our unemployment. So why might we want a minimum wage? We covered some of these arguments last time. Employers have incentives to exploit workers. Low wage workers typically have lower levels of education. A little bit of a summary here of good idea, bad idea. Um, why might minimum wage be a good idea to encourage honest work? No matter your skills, you should be able to have a decent standard of living and encourage you to keep working rather than to try to cheat the system or rely on handouts from the government. Uh, we want to protect workers from being exploited by their employers, um, which is a situation in which the few are enriched at the great hardship of the many. Um, employers and employees do not actually have equal power in as this is, that's a little bit of a, a you know, a, opinion statement by me, but I don't think it's that big of a reach to say that employers and employees do not have equal power in the labor market. Anybody who works at a job and has a boss that feels like their boss has power over them knows this. Um, and the idea that minimum wage is bad is essentially just this argument from back here about the deadweight loss area. You can see the deadweight loss area here. This is inefficiency created for an entire society because of this minimum wage. So that's the main argument against minimum wage. Now what I'd like you to do is to take this idea of minimum wage and apply it to a monopsony graph. Um, this looks quite confusing. So uh, let me look it over with you for a few minutes uh, so you can really grasp what's going on here. So w, w sub E is the wage that the monopsonist was paying um, 
before any minimum wage was applied. And if you remember, the quantity of labor that the monopsonist was hiring was uh, lower than the equilibrium quantity. If public policymakers can succeed in finding the exact right minimum wage, in this case, I have put the exact right minimum wage for this market as W sub M or wage minimum. Um, what we see is a flattening of the marginal resource cost curve. You remember earlier our um, derivation, our numerical derivation of the marginal resource cost curve and why it's above the supply of labor curve. Well, the marginal resource cost curve is flat under a minimum wage situation. You can hire the first unit of labor for the minimum wage. If you want to hire another unit of labor, it's still the minimum wage. If you want to hire another, it's still the minimum wage and so on and so on and so on and so on and so on. Now, once you get uh, the monopsonist gets up to Q sub E quantity of labor hired, they're going to have to start paying more than the minimum wage to get that next person to join the labor pool and be hired by the coal company, I think was our example from earlier. Um, in which case, if they want to hire the Q E plus one unit of labor, they're going to need to give all of the other people who are already working there, already willing and able to work there, a raise. And that's why marginal resource cost for that very next worker jumps way up here. And so this kind of gap in the marginal resource cost curve um, just represents an area in which if the marginal revenue product curve falls anywhere in that gap, that's the quantity that the firm would hire. Um, so with this perfectly set minimum wage, the market does achieve the socially optimal wage and level of employment. Um, I'm going to move my face again, sorry. The minimum wage changes the firm's marginal resource costs so that it will hire the market efficient quantity of labor and is forced to pay the market efficient wage. So what we see here is a new area of producer surplus. Um, and a new area of consumer surplus. And that area that is uh, cordoned off with the little dotted line is a transfer from uh, firms to individuals. You'll also see that deadweight loss under this situation is eliminated. Um, how does a firm know, or how do public policymakers know what the exact right minimum wage is? Well, that's a question uh, for upper division economics and uh, something that um, there isn't a great deal of agreement on. Though what we do see in the real world are various municipalities, states, cities, counties that set their own minimum wages and then look back at the data. So it's kind of like a walking out onto thin ice kind of scenario. Can I change the minimum wage a little bit? What kind of effect does that have on employment? Can I change the minimum wage, raise it a little bit more? What kind of effect does that have on employment? Um, and if you are an observer of minimum wage laws that uh, happen at state levels, they're usually phased in over a, a great number of years, like California passed the minimum wage increase that was to be phased in over five years, I believe a number of years ago. Um, and the reason for that is to a give employers the time to adapt of course but b to also uh, try to discern if that minimum wage has gone too far or not um, which is an important piece of the economic analysis here here's a practice question and i have the solutions up next so pause the video if you'd like to work through this practice question on um, wages and a monopsonistic market and now that you've unpaused, I will show you the uh, correct responses. So for part A, marginal revenue product equals marginal resource cost at 100 units of labor. And the firm then for part B would need to pay $10 per hour in order to hire that 100 units of labor. So 100 units comes from this spot, plug that into the supply curve, we get $10. So that's A and B. For part C1, 200 units of labor is where supply of labor meets the demand for labor curve. So 200 units of labor would be the competitive market uh, quantity. $15 an hour would be the wage, but that's not part of the question. So if the government imposed that minimum wage at $12.50, we would see 150 units of labor hired. The marginal factor cost curve in this example would be flat at 1250 until it reaches the supply of labor, at which point it would jump way up here. Um, you will not be called on to create that graph, although this is uh, what you would need to do to analyze that graph. All right, 
Thanks very much. I'll see you next time. Bye for now.